And you've joined us for our panel today. Hello, I'm Donna Vincent Roa, Project Director of USAID's Partnerships Incubator. This is a project that is implemented by the Kaizen Company, a Tetra Tech company. Welcome to our panel today. It's Localization in Action, a Trilateral Perspective to Achieve Results. Today's discussion is focused on exploring effective localization through the voices of different stakeholders, USAID, an implementing partner, and a local partner. We'll be hearing from colleagues today on the Partnerships Incubator, USAID staff, and our local partner from USAID's Boresha Jami Health Project. Now, the Partnerships Incubator is a USAID project set up under the new Partnerships Initiative nearly five years ago as a pilot for the agency. Now, based on our unique framework, our origin, and our partnership with the agency on its localization efforts, the incubator has acquired a set of fascinating best practices on localization. Today, we're going to explore and showcase examples of operationalizing localization and achieving results for and with local and non-traditional partners. Now I'd like to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Brandon, would you kick us off? Well, thank you, Donna, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Brandon Sitzman, Deputy Project Director and Technical Director for the Partnerships Incubator. Bienvenida, Jolie. Muchas gracias, Donna. Buenos dias. Hi, everyone. My name is Yolanda Martinez. I work for USAID El Salvador and Central America and Mexico Regional Mission. Um, we're here in the heart of the Americas in Central America, so delighted to be with you. Thank you. Habari, Dr. Solomon. Thank you very much, Donna. I'm happy to be with you here today. My name is Dr. Solomon Herrera. I work with USID Barasa Jami, a project that was the prime is Jaramogi Oginga Dinga University of Science and Technology in Kenya, Western region of Kenya. Thank you. It's great to have all of you here with us. And Brendan, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. I'll start with you with two related questions. The first one is, what does the incubator do to meet the agency's mandate for localization? And the related question is, how has the incubator been a strategic force in helping the agency operationalize localization? Great. Thanks, Donna. Uh, it really is great to be here today as part of today's event. Um, before I respond to the uh, question about what we've done to support USAID's localization mandate, I think it's important to set the stage a little bit. I believe there are two reasons that we've been able to support USAID so successfully in their vision for localization. First, from the very beginning, we've had the complete trust of the agency. What I mean by that is uh, thanks to the very strong relationships with the champions and ambassadors of localization within USAID, the ones that have given us the freedom and also a mandate to innovate, the incubator's way of working and delivering services has created and informed the expectations of our government counterparts. The second uh, item, and as you and I have often said, Donna, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. That's just as true for the local and non-traditional partners that we've sought to support as it is for our own team. So as when we were staffing up the incubator, we wanted to ensure that everyone on our team received opportunities to contribute and to have their voices heard. And I believe that this intentionality that um, we put in place really helped establish remarkable team dynamics that led to the success of the incubator. So during this, our final year, we even flipped the script a bit, and we have some of our more junior colleagues leading really critical engagements with USAID and partners, while the senior staff has taken more of a support function. The goal, of course, in all of this work and the approach we've taken is to support the next generation of development professionals in all that we do. So that's a little background. So with all of that, those systems in place, what did we actually do with USAID and the partners? So <clears throat> localization isn't new. Uh, it's been an evolving concept for a long time, but in the last 20 years in particular, it's brought a really renewed focus on inclusivity of and the support for the local partners. Uh, while development often leaps forward, I believe, dramatically with technological breakthroughs, 
the fundamental progress is often slow and grinding and can only be made when people connect within a system to support each other, each person and organization playing a contributing role to the whole. So in that sense, for far too long, uh, local organizations were not included in a very substantive way, and in some cases even excluded from that process. So USAID's focus on localization for us has really opened up space uh, for the incubator to contribute in a way that, quite honestly, I, I never would have imagined when we started. Um, the incubator, as you mentioned at the beginning, is a five-year, $47 million USAID Washington managed global service hub. It's quite a mouthful, um, but it is open to all parts of the agency. And we had a threefold mandate, which was to identify and engage new and local partners, to provide training and capacity strengthening assistance, and then to develop resources and models to advance localization and inclusive development. The first two goals of engaging and providing capacity strengthening support to partners are what we at the incubator referred to as directed services, while developing resources more broadly was indirect support. So during our five years, we've worked with more than 35 missions, bureaus, and operating units in both directed and indirect service requests. Direct services for USAID include and uh, still include activities such as partner landscape assessments, of which we have completed 13, um, partner assessments, project turnaround for activities that we're struggling to deliver, and co-creation and co-design efforts with partners. I would say, Perhaps, though, the most significant work that we've had has been with the 78 partner organizations in the development and the humanitarian space to whom we've provided customized and uh, customized technical assistance and capacity strengthening support at the direction and discretion of USAID. And that phrase is rather important for us because we only worked directly with local and non-traditional partners that were assigned to us by USAID in order to reach a wider audience of new local and non-traditional organizations, we focused on indirect service support. And we did this primarily through communications, translation, and website activities. The website, in terms of indirect services, I think has been our most impactful element. It's evolved from a .org to now its inclusion as a .gov platform within the domain of USAID. Since its launch in November of 2021, the website has had more than 2,710,000 unique page views, and it's reached over 315,000 unique visitors. And it's really what's available on the site that's drawn organizations and individuals to it. Uh, there are resources such as a partner check, partnership checklist, uh, pre-engagement assessment, which help local organizations to understand what it means to work with USAID. There's a partner directory and a private sector front door to help partners find one another. And when they are ready to pursue a partnership, the website has integrated USAID funding opportunities and a new unsolicited submissions portal in its list of resources. So personally, I think this is the biggest evolution for the website um, and the biggest impact for the, for the incubator. And recently we launched the uh, platform itself in, in uh, additional language other than English to include Spanish, French, and Arabic, which to me, it has been quite remarkable and to be part of that effort. So with all of these innovations in one place, um, I believe we've really delivered on USAID's effort to reach local audiences. The incubator's end goal, of course, as a third party service provider is to fully bridge the spectrum of needs between USAID and new local and non-traditional partners that it's seeking to connect with. We've done this by amplifying USAID's localization message and expanding the agency's capacity to work with partners. And when we help those partners work with the agency, we in turn have elevated those partners and catalyzed their reputation as local leaders, knowledge holders, and innovators. And with the rest of our panel today, we're gonna hear about that spectrum of the agency through us as a third party uh, provider to the local level partner. And I'm really excited to hear from both Jolie and uh, Solomon today. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. On the next question, I'll turn it over to Yoli. You were with the USAID mission in El Salvador, and we've been collaborating with you for quite some time. Actually, I think it's more than three and a half years. You approached the incubator with this tremendous vision for expanding <laughs> what USAID's localization efforts look like in your country. 
Now, those efforts started with a comprehensive partner uh, landscape analysis. This is structured around your uh, CDCS, uh, that is the Missions Country Development Cooperation Strategy, and then the delivery of two public Spanish la language webinars in support of your annual program statement issued by the mission. Now, after those were successfully delivered, you came back to us. You came back to the incubator with an even bolder and more innovative idea for supporting local organization. We were super excited because you envisioned directly engaging with a dozen current or potential local partners in long-term capacity strengthening. But you also envisioned reaching hundreds of other organizations that could also deliver outstanding uh, development outcomes, whether through USAID or through other uh, avenues. So I'm speaking, of course, today about the wonderful and the now public Capitalo program. So Yoni, what were your objectives and what did you hope to achieve in terms of the localization outcomes through all of these activities? I think the mission was, like you said, very bold um, and it empowered us um, to really think outside the box, not only to think outside the box, but to formulate task orders, which is what we did with you guys with Scopes of Works, that would allow us to do something sustainable and that would reach not only the local organizations of El Salvador, but throughout the region as we're a bilateral mission, but we also have a regional operating unit. So in essence, um, you, you, you shared our story. We started seeing what the landscape was. Then we shared the opportunities we had. Um, and when we shared the opportunities through our annual program statement, we had a lot of responses, but there was a gap. So when we engaged these 12 local organizations that you mentioned, they were in different levels. We had organizations that were ready to receive an award from us, organizations that had never worked with us, organizations that had um, already been a subcontractor or a subgrantee in one of our awards. So we had a very big variety, but that wasn't enough. We used to call that the inch wide mile deep support, the 12 organizations. So when we went to Captalo, which in Spanish that is like catch it. If you speak Spanish, you would you would you would you would see it. Um, so catch it is the word. <laughs> catch the idea, catch the funding, catch the attention of the donors um, was what Captalo did, and that was what we were calling the mild, wide, inch deep approach. We wanted to make a road available for Spanish speaking organizations to learn the basic about working with donors. Yes, working with USAID, but also broadening their, their vision to what it means to work with an international partner. So eh, in Spanish, Captalo means Curso de Captación para el Avance y Creación de Alianzas para Organizaciones Locales. So it's a course that will foster and will create alliances, not only among local organizations, but organizations, but also with USAID and other donors. And I think we were able to reach over 30 organizations in our first cohort throughout El Salvador. And now we have um, people joining from South America, so out Central America, from Mexico, who are taking this currently available resource in Spanish for organizations who have never worked with USAID. And we start from anywhere as the organization the the international agreements that there exist I can intro to that but then we go very into the details about the type of finance mechanisms and tools that you need to have in place to do procurement to hire people to do teaming agreements because some of these organizations have never even heard the word teaming agreement so we felt um, that that was a great way for organizations to reach a new level. And in the chat, we will leave for you a, a series of links, for example, um, the Capitolo website that's still available and running and the blogs, both in English and Spanish, that we partner with the incubator to do to make sure that 
people reach it in their language. And it doesn't matter if you have never worked with USAID, this is an opportunity to learn about us. And it was so successful that two of our local organizations that already have awards with us have showcased that as part of their resources um, to their new partners. So it's not only in um, workwithusaid.gov as a Spanish resource still available for people to reach, but it's also from local organizations being shared to other local organizations as a tool. It's like, this is what we need to know to start conversations with USAID. Um, we even, I think um, our team will, will put the link to a small social media video, of like 30 seconds or less, so that you see um, many of us just engaging with these local organizations and getting them through this cohort that allow them to learn more, engage better, and hopefully go through the growing pains of working with USAID. And I say that gladly. <laughs> Over to you, Donna. Great. Thanks a lot. Where do you feel you are today in terms of engagement with local and non-traditional partners in El Salvador? And I really want to know, where do you want to go next? I'll answer the first one. I don't know how to answer the second one yet <laughs> without getting in trouble. Um, the the Where we are, I think that we are engaging with local organizations at a level that we didn't have before. Part of the, the um, successes that we had with Capital o is that we have an ongoing community of local organizations um, and also with our, our incubator portion of the 12 organizations that they became mentors to each other. So I think we're in a good place. I think there's still a lot to do. Um, there's always opportunity to grow more in the work with local organizations because it's it's not an easy road, but it's a great road to take. Where we're going next, I think um, we definitely want to follow um, the guidance provided by the agency policy and, and get and reach um, the targets that we've been given. But I think my 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 goal, as I see it as a dream, if I can think of a bold idea going forward, is to see more local organizations teaming as partners with implementing partners teaming with the mission in different areas and not seeing themselves only as a beneficiary of support or a subcontractor or a sub grantee that can ex execute little things, but to give that next step like we've had with some of our local organizations that now have small direct awards, but still very significant to us. Great. Thank you so much. It was Definitely an exciting project, and there's still legacy results happening as we speak. Solomon, you engaged with the Partnerships Incubator in a very different way. USAID's Boratia Jami Hill Project had been awarded to the Jaramogi Ojingo Odinga University of Science and Technology, also known as JUST as a first time local partner with USAID Kenya. Now this was a sizable award that was given to you to deliver services in the area of family planning, reproductive, maternal, newborn and child, adolescent health, also in water and sanitation and wash and nutrition. Now you were brought on as an experienced chief of party and an expert in the field to be able to lead the work. Now. While there was never any doubt about the technical proficiency of your staff and their ability to deliver on the project goals, JUICED and UBJ did struggle with many of the um, administrative and reporting requirements that came with USAID funding. Now, USAID Kenya recognized the project's struggles and they engaged the incubator to work with you to deliver support in two areas. The first, was on relational dynamics within the project. And then the second was technical assistance to UBJ in developing relevant systems, procedures, and even policies for you to maintain compliance with your award. Now, what was your initial reaction when you found out that USAID Kenya had asked the incubator to provide you with support? Thank you very much, Donna, and it is a pleasure to be with the team this evening. It is evening here. 
my reaction was that of excitement. Excitement in the sense that we had been discussing this struggle for quite some time. And we had identified, I had identified that the biggest challenge I had was understanding the prime which was ghost, understanding the responsibility that goal with a USAID award. That was number one. Number two, the issue of governance in relationship to the project and in relationship to the financing by USAID. Number three, the other challenge was the relationship that then developed between USAID and the prime. Two things came up. Number one was that the prime, which was Joe's, had its own way of governance system, managing other projects by other donors. That was number one. Number two, Joe's did not understand the USAID requirements. And then number three, it, this project was awarded during the COVID period. So there was minimum interaction, physical interaction between the donor and the prime, which is used in terms of capacity building, in terms of trying to understand what was expected of them and what they could understand the dynamics of how the prime used works under, under the statutes of the government because it is a government public institution and the difference between that and USID, which is not our government, it's a US government, but the way of doing business, the way of working was totally different. So why was I excited about this? I was excited about this that I would have a neutral partner who can probably help bridge the gap between the prime, which is dosed, and also USID. That was number one. And then number three, in that drift, I was in the middle. And me and the program was in the middle. I knew and I still know what USID wanted. I did not quite understand, because I hadn't worked in the public sector for a very long time. I didn't understand how having been awarded that sizable amount of grant, the university could not understand how they can follow just the simple rules and the simple dynamics of what USAID wanted. And like you mentioned, it was a difficult nightmare trying to put in policies and guidelines and standard operation procedures, which were totally at variant with what the university followed. And I had a block, I couldn't get that to move. And the coming of the incubator partnership in between, for me was an opportunity I saw that I could get an arbitrator, somebody totally neutral, somebody who could help me help understand, help me convince the university to understand that all this is for their good. And luckily enough, when the incubator team came in. A few things they did which made a lot of sense to me. The first thing they did was to try and understand the dynamics of what is going on. Dynamics from the university side, dynamics from the program side, from the staff themselves, and also dynamics from USID. This, I thought, was a very beautiful way of looking at it. They came with an open mind just to try and understand, wait, hey guys, what has been going on? And once they understood that, and then with the vision of localization, and we, some of us had been prepared for that localization because USAID Kenya and East Africa started talking about it in, in 2018, when they started with the journey to self-reliance. And following immediately after the journey to self-reliance was localization. Why did localization come in? Localization, in my interpretation, having worked in that space for quite some time, was such that we can have a cohort of institutions and personnel who can run the programs, who can manage the programs, who can see the benefits, and can do it even without you know, USID having to be there every day. 
that to some of us was the most beautiful thing that happened. And because I'd been in the same space for some time, I was able now to coordinate with the partners we work with. The major partner was the government in terms of the departments of health and department of water. I was now able to work with them and tell them, hey, look here, guys, this time around, it is us. We are the ones, local people, managing this program. And our vision is for you to reap maximum benefit. And you want to coordinate in such a way that the communities who receive the, the benefits of the service delivery, because we are a service delivery program, to be able to embrace the services that are being provided. That was number one. The health providers that will be doing this, providing these services, to also take it as a responsibility and as a duty of something that they need to do. And they don't need to be whipped or to be supervised on a day to minute to minute basis to do what they are doing. That has done fairly well. And one of the benefits has, that has come with it is the fact that for now, the government and the donors have gone back to a level where they are asking the local to take charge of their own health, their own services. And we are going to what is called the primary healthcare approach and the, using the primary care network. And this is working fairly well for now, and it is an offshoot of localization. And for that, one of the things that the incubator helped me personally and all generally is insisting that in any future engagement, in any future awards, there must be a consistent, regular engagement between the local partner, the donor, and the program, so that all of us are on the same page, so that we understand that. And I'm happy to report, number one, that capacity building is ongoing. And four major areas were identified by incubator, and USID has picked them up, and there's a mechanism that is doing that to date capacity building on the whole issue of governance and administration, policy use and policy development. The highest level of managers from the universities that have been, from the local partners that have been awarded any award have undergone that training. And together with the leadership of the program. The second area that they have looked at, which is also capacity building is ongoing, supported by USID now, is grants and financial management. Those were some of the issues that had been identified and that's in the incubator partnership re-emphasized. The third area is the whole area of human resource management. And again, the, remember the, the capacity building involves the university and also the, the program leadership. And then the final, area that has been, this has been the first phase, is the whole area of project management. Again, they are bringing in university staff plus the project staff. The whole idea is to develop a cohort, a cohort and a pool of people from the university who can then be able to run and manage the project. But finally, the most important thing that we are seeing in this is bringing in students from the university to be able to work, to be able to learn from the project. This will give us a pool of potential future program managers who are learning on the job. They are being trained in their university. The university is running a program and they participate in running the program. And the lessons that we have learned in the past will now no longer be able to be the problem. And that the lesson is, the university leadership do not have to be cagey that somebody is taking their baby, somebody is taking their program. Thank you very much. And I think that, that has been very, very useful for us to date. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, you did say the word future. So I'm going to reference that and ask you, what would you like to see USAID and other donors do more in the future for first-time partners or local organizations? 
Thank you very much, Donna. That, is, that, is, that has been a pet subject of mine, particularly after having interacted with the incubator team and their follow-on uh, mechanism. One, there need to be regular engagement between the recipient and the donor. This engagement should spell out the rules of the game. Not only spelling out, but teaching them to understand why those rules of the game were put there. Capacity building a larger cohort, whereby we do not have the big man syndrome only being told about the project. Yeah, what I'm talking about the big man syndrome is you have one person who is doing everything, who knows everything from the university. You find that to be very dangerous. You need a cohort of people trained, a cohort of people whose capacity are built, a cohort of people who understand the value and the need to have this program. And in so doing, they should also engage in not only looking at the technical areas, but also helping the new, the new awardees to also learn from their peers, the ones who have already had the experience before. And what works, what did not work for them, and how they mitigated what did not work, and what they did, how they scaled up what worked, and how the, all the way up to, if it is a service delivery program, all the way up to the recipients of the services that they are delivered. If that is done, and I can tell you, this week, the week ending now, we had we had a performance review meeting in one of the program areas that is water sanitation and hygiene and all the participants including people from usid went to the sites and the communities where we are delivering those projects what amazed them was the fact that the communities the people receiving the health workers working in those areas plus our staff from the project we're all speaking the same language in the sense that they have done the work together, they have owned the work, and they think it is very, very useful the way they have interacted with the donor, with the project leadership, with the county or district leadership, including the health workers and the population. So I would want to see more of those engagements. Any, any issues that are identified are corrected on the spot. Any, any challenges that are encountered are, ad, are addressed on the spot, not leaving them until they pile up, then it becomes a challenge, and this should be upfront. For example, one of the things that we did not have, there are things that were identified in pre-award assessment. Nobody followed up whether the university did them or not, and that has become a major challenge. And one of the things I now pride myself and the incubator team is that Following the experiences we have had at those, new awardees are now being sent to me to discuss with them what some of the things to avoid, to learn from my experiences. And I'm feeling proud about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brendan, we've heard Jolie talk about Captalo and Solomon talk about the dramatic turnaround at UBJ. What was it like from your perspective as an agency-sponsored support mechanism to work with both of them? And then how do these types of support mechanisms bridge the gap between USAID and local organizations? Yeah. Well, first, I think as everyone has just heard so eloquently from both uh, uh, Jolie and, and Solomon, um, for me, it was such a rewarding and fulfilling experience professionally and personally. Working with both of them was just absolutely incredible. Um, they are outstanding individuals, uh, they and their teams. Um, so from the very beginning, Jolie was just such a vo vocal advocate for our involvement with the mission's localization efforts. Um, and you know everything that USAID El Salvador was willing to do and to, to, to take those risks. Um, through her guidance, they really allowed us to innovate and push boundaries in all of our work and in our approach to what it meant to work with the local partners. Uh, on Captalo, um, they really let us explore content, design, even the technology platforms um, that we ended up using. And we're really new to the mission. Um, getting clearances, working through all of that was really uh, uh, 
difficult, but it was worth it. Um, and the freedom to do all of this, to really iterate, help the project evolve over time. And what we envisioned, as you heard, um, as something for 12 partners soon became much larger and now is out there in the world for any local organization to participate in, in, in Spanish language. Um, and we didn't know it at the time, but this uh, work that we did with the USAID El Salvador mission on Captalo um, also helped set the stage for the agency's requests that the incubator received to support them on standardized approach to delivering post-award training to all new local partners. And this is another tool, another effort that we're working on and uh, focused, as I said, on new local and non-traditional partners. And that will be rolling that um, support out to the agency uh, this fall before we close. Um, for Baresha Jami, I mean, Solomon and his team were, as he alluded to, excited to, to work with us, but they were really open and willing to work um, from the very beginning. And beyond the technical assistance, which we've talked a little bit about, and we alluded to the relational dynamics that we focused on between or among Juiced, uh, UBJ, and USAID Kenya themselves. And this meant assessing the communication flows, roles, and responsibilities among all three of those stakeholders and making recommendations. And everybody was very receptive to that uh, along the way because um, some things were working very well and everybody likes to hear that, but many things were not among the three entities. And I would say for a USAID partner, let alone a first time local partner, um, to be asked to be that honest and vulnerable, it's a scary position to put yourself in. And only with Solomon's leadership as a chief of party, uh, I believe he set the stage for our team to come in to what could have been a very challenging situation and be very successful. And that's also true of the of the USAID mission themselves. They asked us to also come in, um, not just to focus on the partner, but to take a look at their involvement and what they had done uh, in setting up the project. So I think these two examples, um, as well as others that we really haven't mentioned today, have demonstrated to USAID not only the need, um, but also what can be done to support new local and non-traditional partners. Um, but what I'd really like to do, I want to I want to turn this back over actually to Jolie and Solomon. So um, I'd like to ask them, and I'll start with you first, Jolie. How important was it for you to have a third party working with you in supporting in a supporting role um, as we tried to bridge? the gap or the bridge, the, the the conversation between donor and local partner? I think it's extremely relevant, um, super relevant um, to have a partner. Um, the way that I see it is that the mission would have been able to have some reach, but having the incubator side by side with us allow us to amplify. And I think that was in several instances, the case. But just to to summarize a couple of things, um, since if we have a little bit of time, you let me know. But I think that starting with the partner landscape assessment, it allows us to understand what was out there. It also set the stage for other missions to pursue partner landscape assessments, and it creates a vision of how much is out there to help or engage or not to help or not engage. And for us, it was eye opening. Then. When we did the first, um, the, the, the second um, approach to the NPA and we did the presentations of our APS, we thought, oh, we're going to communicate, we're going to engage, that's going to be awesome. And we did. And we had a great reach and we had a lot of responses, but then we saw a gap. So I think having a partner that you can have like a sounding board and as a, as a, also as a, a creative partner on how you engage and how do you evolve and how do you take the next step was super critical. So when we did um, the third scope of work where we engaged these 12 organizations and we saw the gaps there, we saw there is a need for a USAID 101 type course, right? In Spanish for people to understand with us. And I think like you mentioned, Brandon, having somebody next to us and how we designed the course on what tools we went through, even going to the CIO and see how we were going to do the whole platform. Like it really helped having a partner because if one person wouldn't make a difference, but 
if there is an ecosystem of support, not only within the mission with the empowerment, but also a partner next to you saying, no, this is a good idea. We can move this way. We can do this. We can do that. And being as flexible as both the mission and you were. And I think that is very important. Sometimes when we talk about acquisition mechanisms, like the one that we work with you guys, we, oh, this is a contract. This is very structured. This is, we are not going to move from this. And we were able to keep every part of the framework that we are normally used to in acquisition. But I think that the partnership inside of it gave it the flexibility that we needed to move. Sometimes um, it is important to see that acquisition mechanisms are a skeleton, right? It is there and you won't make or shape it differently, but you need the heart and the muscles to make it flexible, to make it move and to make a difference. And I think that's what we were doing with you guys through the entire process. So it was important to me, it was important to the mission, it was important to the partners. And something that Solomon brought up that I thought was very key is sometimes we see it, USAID is one person. No, 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 it's it's a group. The partnership is the COP. No, it's the entire group. And then the local partners also learned that. It's not one person between their um, institution that's going to present um, a response to 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 a proposal, it will be their entire team. And I think that was the greatest shift that we saw in the mindsets of some of our local organizations. So um, it, it was a bridge. It, no human being can learn to walk without another human being teaching that human being to talk, to walk, right? Or to talk. And I think it's the same with local organizations. I don't think that there is one local organization that can do everything by itself without um, some pixie dust, I guess, <laughs> from the support of another person and another institution that has gone through that, that knows the path, and that can help them breach the, those gaps and change those mindsets. So to me, I think it was very important. I, I do highlight that um, having a third party working with the mission and with the partner in a supporting role was important to bridge the gap. And I think what I like to highlight the most between the relationship that the mission had with the incubator, both in DC and the implementing partner, um, Kaisen, was um, you guys, how, how you really trust us as a partner and how we were also trusting you as partners. And the more that that relationship is duplicated throughout that trust relationship between the partner at DC, the mission, the local actors happens, the truer development that we will do. So I'm extremely thankful to everybody involved both in DC and Washington DC in the incubator as a whole, the local team, you, you mentioned it at the beginning, um, we had some of the junior consultants at the end taking um, leadership roles that to me were fantastic because you were also empowering these local um, teammates to be full front and center in some of the decisions for design and implementation that I thought that was wonderful. So um, that growth obviously came with some growing pains, which I think we all are accustomed, but I think that it was an experience that I'm willing and ready to replicate as long as we can to continue helping local organizations. Thank you so much, Jolie. I appreciate all of that and such a, a robust response. And Solomon, I want to ask you from your perspective as that first time local partner or project um, with Juiced at the university, how important was it to have a third party working with you to bridge the gap between yourself and USAID and the award? Did the question come through, Solomon? Were you able to hear the question? I'm curious about your perspective about having a third party. How important was it to help bridge that gap? Thank, thank you very much, Brandon. Um, one of the things that I must really appreciate is the fact that uh, from the time you started engaging with the incubator partnership, there was an 
an air of relief in the sense that we are now more able to engage with the university more effectively at different levels. We started streamlining communication channels, which was a major challenge. Number three, we also started having more constructive engagement between the university and also the, the USID, the donor. Uh, following that, I've had to take a number of you know, USID leadership to the university, something I was not able to do before. That has really, really been useful. It is now a more relaxed environment to work in compared to what it was before. And then the other issue that we are now pursuing is actually getting a training which is run and coordinated by the university in terms of practical experiences in program management at the community level. That is the, That will go a long way in strengthening localization for the future generation. And uh, USID has given us a thumbs up that if that works, it will, it will enhance localization and we are moving on ahead with it. And one of the issues that has been useful because of that communication barrier that was broken and we are now able to engage very effectively. There is a program that, which I mentioned earlier, primary care network and primary, primary health care. I have been allowed to try and do a prototype where there is total involvement by the locals and the one that is also being supported by the donors and the government, uh, which is uh, prescribed kind of. The one I'm prototyping is where everybody comes to the table and we agree as locals, how can we run this program? How can we design this program so that it is effective for us? For me, that is, if that works and we can be able to demonstrate it, it will be one of the most important achievements of localization, where you get the local people designing, putting in the monitoring, I think, monitoring and evaluation parameters, and at the same time looking at the impact in the final analysis. All this would not have been possible earlier on when I joined the program more than two years ago. But now we are in a space where we are able to discuss that. We are actually putting it in as a collaboration, a collaboration and adaptation learning agenda. And that will be very, very useful for the university as a niche that they need to create for themselves. Thank you. Well, this has been an exciting panel for today, and it's been both an honor and a pleasure to work on these two projects. I want to thank all the panelists for their insights, as well as you, the audience, for your attention today. I personally feel very inspired by this conversation and by all the sessions in the SID conference, and I hope all of you feel the same way. So thanks again. I'm Dr. Donna Vincent Roa, the Project Director of USAID's Partnerships Incubator, signing off for all of us today. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, bye. Gracias, thank you, bye. Asante sana. Asante sana. <laughs> thank you very much. <bye. laughs>